All right, guys, in part four, we're going to talk about the diseases of the veins. We're also going to talk a little bit about the trauma and shock and some of the rare diseases. So when we look at diseases of the vein, we're going to look at phlebitis. Phlebitis is an inflammation of the superficial veins. The symptoms that come into play, guys, are pain, swelling. There will be a red cord-like hardening along the vein as it goes towards the heart. And a treatment when we're looking at this is going to be, of course, some painkillers, analgesics, warm compresses might help, elevating the area above the heart to help drain some of that extra fluid, some elastic stockings, we talk about like compression hose may be helpful, and exercise. Okay, moving those muscles will help push some of that fluid out of there, which might help with some of that inflammation. Another thing that we can see is where we can be actually very specific, where we look at thrombophlebitis is a clotting in the vessels of the legs, thighs, and pelvis. So we're talking specifically about those lower extremities. These are going to be asymptomatic until an embolization occurs, until a clot actually forms that causes major issues. Risk factors of developing these guys is immobility. If you're not moving around properly, you're immobile, say you're on bed rest or something like that, your chances of, of throwing a clot here is very much increased. Another is dehydration. If you have varicose veins present, if you've had leg or pelvic surgery recently, you're obese, or you have a pregnancy, these are all things that can increase the risks of developing these blood clots. Now, if these blood clots do develop in a deeper vein, these are a lot of times are called deep vein thrombosis or a DVT. Now, when we develop these clots and we see that there's that inflammation that's present in those blood vessels, we wanna treat them. And we wanna do this by reducing the clot itself. We wanna prevent it from doing being, being turned into an embolus. So we wanna make sure it doesn't get broken off and travel to another area. And we can do this a lot of times by using things like anticoagulant drugs, okay, to help break up the blood clot. Now this picture just shows you some of the more common areas where we see that there can be a DVT and some of the other areas where you just see more of that inflammation of the blood vessels that take place. The next one we see are called varicose veins. Varicose veins are dilated torturous and elongated veins in the legs. You can see them here. They're very ugly, they, very, they can hurt, and a lot of times they're caused by prolonged sitting or standing. Pregnancy can cause these, and so can obesity. Symptoms, the legs can start to become fatigued and have cramps. The veins start to thicken. Fluid can start to develop and, and pool, and this can cause edema or swelling. How do we treat varicose veins? Well, we can elevate the legs. This is where that kind of saying comes in whenever they say, oh yeah, I gotta get home, I've had a hard day work, I'm gonna go put my feet up. That actually helps with this. It helps drain the fluid out, it helps with swelling, but it can also help with the varicose veins. Walking can also help, all right? So if you're standing a lot on your job and you're not moving very much, you have a higher risk of developing varicose veins. Using support or elastic hose may be helpful. But if they're bad enough, we may have to actually go in and strip these veins. Stripping the veins helps get them to where the blood flow can be um, restored and it actually is going to keep them from getting so thickened. Okay, so they can go in and strip those veins. So guys, we increase our risks a lot of times if you're on your feet a lot and especially if you're standing still on hard surfaces. This is why a special pair of shoes or good pair of shoes is really good when you're working, especially if you're doing like a 12 hour shift as a nurse or even more importantly, if you're working like an OR where you're not moving very much during that, that extended period of time. Also, a lot of times a mat or cushion that you can stand on will also be helpful. All right, let's talk a little bit about trauma when we talk about the cardiovascular system. The biggest thing that is gonna cause issues is hemorrhaging. Okay, hemorrhaging is an abnormal loss of blood. This could be acute or it could be a chronic type of hemorrhaging. Guys, a lot of times with an acute hemorrhage, you're losing lots of blood very quickly. In a chronic, you're losing a, you're losing a large amount of blood, but you're doing it over an extended period of time. Exsanguination starts to happen, and this is the loss of circulating blood. Internal bleeding can lead to anemia. This anemia could lead to shock due to large amounts of the blood being lost. 
Low pressure vessels lead to petechiae and ecma ecmacosis of purpura. This just means that it makes these very little like spider webby type breaks in the blood vessels and bruises that take place. High pressure vessels are going to lead to squirting of bright red blood. Okay, so if it's a low pressure vessel, you're going to see that it bursts a little bit and you see a spider webby type structure, a bruise. But if it's a high pressure vessel that breaks, you're going to see a squirting and that's due to the high pressure from the, each heartbeat that takes place. Now, if you lose a lot of blood, it could lead to shock. This is when you have extremely low blood pressure and it leads to decreased tissue perfusion. You're not getting enough oxygen and nutrients or even blood at all to your tissues. Now there's different types of shock. There's cardiogenic shock, and that's a heart issue, not being able to get the blood to the body. There's septic shock, where the blood is actually infected with something, it's toxic. Hypovolemic shock is where the volume of your blood is too low, so your blood pressure drops. That's due to the hemorrhaging or the bleeding out. Neurogenic shock is gonna be where the nerves are actually the culprit, okay? not allowing the blood to, to pump properly, low blood pressure. Or also anaphylactic shock, which is going to be due to a um, reaction. And okay? when we talk about an allergic reaction. So these are different types of shock. Now, no matter what kind of shock you have, you're going to see some similar symptoms. We're going to have facial paler, where the face is going to go very pale. Their skin will start to be cool and clammy. They'll start to have stenosis, or where we see a blue-like um, look to especially their lips, their nose, or their nail beds because they're not getting enough oxygen to those areas. We'll see the patient will have tachycardia because the heart's trying to compensate as well as tachypnea where your breathing is trying to help. They'll have altered mental status because not enough blood and oxygen is getting to the brain. This could lead to syncope, which is fainting, unconsciousness, and then one of the best indicators of whether or not we're getting enough blood and oxygen to organs is looking at the urine. Where we talk about oguria or anuria, meaning that there is no urine being produced or there's only a low amount of urine being produced. This is one of the main things to look at if you think a patient may be going into shock is look at how much urine has been produced. If not very much has, this could be an indication, indication that they are in shock. So how do we treat shock? Well, we want the patient to rest in a supine position. That's a face up position. We want to move to warm, move them to a warm and quiet environment. This whole idea is to help keep them calm. This will help their, their sympathetic nervous system shut down and their parasympathetic hopefully come up and start causing them to rest. We'll also want to elevate their feet and legs above their heart, again, to help prevent blood from pooling and making sure we can get the blood back up in order for the, hopefully the blood pressure to also rise. Another thing we want to look at here are some rare diseases. We have malignant hypertension. Malignant hypertension, guys, is in a medical emergency. This is when the high blood pressure is way high for a long period of time. So the top number is between 130 and 170 on a regular basis. This normally causes the patient to have headaches, blurred vision, and also dyspnea that needs to be taken care of. Another rare disease is core pulmonale. Core pulmonale is going to be a lot of times contributed to right-sided heart failure. It causes hypoxia, so the tissues aren't getting enough oxygen and the kidneys start to read that we don't have enough oxygen. So this stimulates the body to actually create more red blood cells. This higher amount of red blood cells starts to actually thicken the blood and the viscosity, which makes it worse in pumping the blood. So it's kind of like they're trying to correct it, but the body makes it worse instead of making it better. And we'll talk a little bit more about this one as well when we get to the um, respiratory chapter. <clears throat> We also have Raynaud's disease. This one is going to happen or be a problem more for women or young women, um, but it does, it can affect anybody. This is a, vaso, a vasospastic issue um, where we see that the there's gonna be this kind of vasoconstriction that occurs in the blood vessels, specifically to the fingers and toes. 
Um, this is going to be triggered by cold temperatures or even stress. And we see a discoloration that happens in the fingers. They'll start to be pale because the blood flow is being restricted. We want to be able to get this blood flow back restored. And we can do this by normally warming up the hands if it's due to being triggered by cold or decreasing the stress. Okay, and this is vasospastic. Boudgers disease is a little different. This is an inflammation that we can see. Um, it does cause potentially clots to form and it can cause atrophy or weakness in different areas as well as ulcers and even gangrene because the, the because the thrombosis or blood clot can restrict the blood flow, causing the tissues on the other side to be necrotic and gangrene to set in. Polyarteritis nodosa, when we look at this one, this is going to be a, a vasculitis, so it's an inflammatory issue. It can actually cause necrotizing lesions to take place, and this has an autoimmune basis. Okay, so this is where the autoimmune system or the immune system is going to attack your own blood vessels, causing them to be inflamed and causing necrosis to take place, necrotic lesions to happen. All right, so these are just some of the kind of the more rare diseases that you won't really see very often, but we did want to hit on them briefly. The last thing here, guys, are effects of aging. There's a lot of things that can happen in your cardiovascular system as we age, and one is decreased contractibility of your heart muscle. It doesn't have that ability to contract as hard as we get older. Our blood vessels lose their elasticity, so they start to harden up even just with age, and they do not have that ability to be able to expand and contract like they're supposed to. And we also see a thickening of the valves that starts to happen. Okay, this is gonna be where we start to see more of a stenosis, a thickening, and blood is not gonna have as easy of a time moving from each chamber in your heart. All right, and these are things that happen with everybody as we age. They might just happen earlier in some individuals than later based on also our lifestyles, our, um, our, our diets, things like that. All right, if you have any questions, please let me know.